the Center for Audit Quality presents Profession in Focus. Hello, and welcome to this edition of Profession in Focus. I'm very pleased today to have with me as my guest, Ken Birch, who is the Executive Director of the Council of Institutional Investors. Ken, yeah. welcome. Yeah, thanks very much, Cindy. I'm glad to be here. So, let's jump right in. You've mm -hmm. been in your role almost a year now, or about a year, and I know that there are a host of issues facing the Council, mm -hmm. as well as your members, mm -hmm. but give us your top priorities. So, the Council has been focused for a long time on, on accountability and on effective governance. Uh, and the fact is that I think corporate governance in the U.S. and in, in most markets around the world is better than it has been uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and, sh and shareholder rights are, are stronger. Uh, there's, there's more work in our view to be done in that regard, but we think it's pretty good. Um, so part of it is uh, defending what we have. Uh, part of it is tr the ongoing work of trying to make sure that uh, boards are effective on the one hand, that disclosure is effective and current and, and working for, for investors. Um, so, so that shapes our priorities. Uh, accountability is number one. We have been pressing in recent years for several things, but they include a majority vote standard in election of directors. We think election of directors is the linchpin of our governance system, and a majority vote just makes much more sense than the plurality vote that had been, had been dominant. A lot more work to do there on the mid-cap and small-cap companies. And then universal proxy card, which has gotten a lot of attention in, in recent months, and that's, um, that's actually quite an important issue. Proxy fights are where uh, the rubber hits the road in, in, uh, in accountability, and I think those mechanisms are extremely important for a fair playing field. Uh, a universal proxy card where you can choose from any candidate who happens to be nominated where there is a proxy fight uh, is much better than requiring straight line proxy voting, if you're uh, a straight, straight line card if you're voting by proxy and particularly for mid-sized institutional investors and retail investors who it's not economic for them to show up at the meeting. Uh, we are a big country, it's expensive to do that. It's expensive actually to try to have other processes or actually uh, impossible unless you're a huge investor. So uh, we think that process is actually quite important. Well, I'm hmm. uh, pleased to hear that the Council of Institutional Investors also has in their sites uh, things that are a benefit for retail investors. I think sometimes yeah. the retail investors get lost in the shuffle, so yeah. it's nice that you're able to include them in your, in your work as well. Yeah, and it's partly because we think the overall process is important, mm -hmm. um, and, and that includes the, the retail component. That's great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to shift gears a little bit and mm -hmm. talk about non-GAAP measures. Mm -hmm. This is um, an item that we've seen many companies uh, relying on uh, recently, mm -hmm. using more and more non-GAAP financial mm -hmm. measures that are outside of the audited financial statements. Mm -hmm. And um, I've heard you speak on that and the CII speak on that, saying that while they can be a helpful measure mm -hmm. uh, and can be useful to investors, there's also the potential to mislead investors if they're not used properly. Mm -hmm. So how do we get the right balance between useful information that's outside of the financial statements mm -hmm. to investors without there being some of the uh, potential for abuses that the SEC itself has highlighted. So um, I agree that there's an appropriate place for non-GAAP financials. There's some places where it's not appropriate. The, the common sense principles that was put out by uh, uh, Jamie Dimon and Warren Buffett and others last year uh, made the point that in equity compensation, for example, it's really not appropriate to exclude that. Mm -hmm. uh, that's an ongoing cost of doing business. Um, but. Uh, there is appropriate use as long as it's not misleading. I think the SEC put out a very good uh, uh, guidance last year in May, um, uh, telling us how to how to uh, th that that the non-GAAP has to be equivalent at least to GAAP, which means I think practically speaking, you lead with a GAAP number and then go to the non-GAAP number and explain why that's better. I think that's better context. There are really two pieces of this. One. Uh, is sort of the headline and lead it needs to be right. Everything needs to be in more or less the right proportion. And then, of course, you need to reconcile um, to gap, uh, and that's actually quite important to our members. So, I, f from uh, what I've seen from quarterly filings, I think um, uh, there's quite a bit of progress uh, actually on this since May. We'll see in proxy statements because you also see a lot of non-gaps in talking about executive non-gap financials and talking about executive compensation. 
uh, that that remains to be seen how, how, how that goes but I I, th I think the SEC really put out a very good uh, change in guidance. Yeah, I do too. And they highlighted some of the things that, that you just talked about. I think they what they bucketed under consistency, yeah. comparability, and right. transparency. Right. That at the minimum you needed to have those three pieces in order to make it so that those numbers right. are less likely to be misleading. Yeah, and frankly, I uh, partly because I'm in governance and I've focused a lot on proxy statements, I actually have a significant amount of concern there. So, so I am interested to see in the spring how that how that works out. Yeah, I think there's more to come on the, the non-GAAP measures. Right, right. Um, so, uh, as you may know, the CAQ recently issued our third annual uh, Audit Committee Transparency Barometer, right. where we point out and give examples of where audit committees more and more are increasing voluntarily mm -hmm. their disclosure about their important oversight work of the financial reporting process and the right. external auditors. And so we were pleased to see that um, since 2014, the percentage of S&P 500 companies, as well as smaller and mid-cap companies, are increasing those disclosures. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that, that you all track as an institutional investors, and do institutional investors find that kind of information helpful? Yes, um, so, so the, the financial reporting is absolutely critical, and the relationship uh, between the audit committee and, and the outside auditor is absolutely critical for investors. Now there's not a lot that's terribly visible, even with the improved disclosures. I think the improved disclosures are important. We're getting more of a sense. So some of them are mechanical, like how long has the audit firm been your auditor? That, that is such an easy fact point, I don't really see any reason not to put it out. But then there's a little bit of qu uh, quality about how we think about choosing the auditor, what, w what we're looking for. Um, assessing the auditor. How we assess the auditor and their work. Um, and, I, and I actually think it's pretty good. Now, a lot of folks have contrasted the U.S. companies generally with the U.K. and particularly Rolls-Royce was sort of the model out there, is the model. Um, and, f you know, I recognize that it's a different litigation environment and so on. It's a di different environment. But I, I think that that is actually quite interesting to investors to the extent that they have something beyond bo boilerplate, uh, something really meaningful. Um, it's never going to be the same as, say, the executive compensation disclosure that al allows you to substantively engage on that matter, probably much to the irritation of some companies, but um, because it's, it's pretty open. Um, you can't really see that much inside uh, the, the relationship with the auditor, but it's actually the most important uh, element of the board's work, arguably, for investors. If the financial reporting is not reliable, that, that goes to the valuation, goes to the, the heart of investment. So it's, it's, it's very important, but on the other hand, eyes glaze over partly because it's not a lot of, lot of disclosure. Well, you said that there's not a lot of transparency, mm -hmm. and one of the things that we hear anecdotally, and in fact some research bears out, is that there's, we hear a lot about engagement between mm -hmm. investors and boards of directors, but I don't think it's yet gotten to engagement between investors and audit committees. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, of course, would give some more transparency to investors as right. to the role that audit committees play. Do you see that as an emerging issue, and do you, do you predict that we'll see more engagement between investors and audit committees? Well, I think we'll see a little bit more. So, so engagement in general with boards has become a little bit more routine. Uh, it was really the say on pay votes that sort of led into it, but you see a broadening out of topics of conversation. Uh, at least from what I from what I hear is is, is going on. Um, again, the disclosure is limited enough that it's hard to, to get at. Um, when you when you as an investor go talk with the uh, a chair of the compensation committee, you have a lot to start with in terms of information, and you don't. And also, it's not appropriate. Uh, there's a limit to what's appropriate for the audit committee chair to tell the investor. Now, I used to work at Moody's, and we had a big project on reevaluating uh, governance of U.S. companies post Enron, post WorldCom, and we went out of our way to talk to chairs of audit committees. Um, now, we at that time had, had some uh, protection from FD and so on. It was, a, it was a different environment a little bit that we were in as compared to an investor. Uh, but we actually had very useful discussions uh, trying to understand how, for example, uh, the audit committee thought about aggressiveness of financial statements, how they quiz the auditor about that, what kinds of what kinds of things did they ask, what did they think about, um, and frankly, there's also some insight into risk management given the, the Sarbanes-Oxley role that sort of defaults to the audit committee 
uh, if, there, if it hasn't been assigned elsewhere. Uh, those questions are actually a little bit easier and are important as well. But um, it, it's, it's actually kind of a tough discussion to have, I think, and that's why people have not, not been seeking out the audit chair. The other thing I'd say is that the triggers for involvement have been, have tended to be either an executive pay issue, again, because the disclosure's out there, um, or uh, a, a real concern about where the company is and where it's going. And, and in the latter, people t uh, are most interested in talking, if they're talking to a board member, to the lead director or the independent chairman. Mm -hmm. So, Ken, it occurs mm -hmm. to me, as you're getting ready to celebrate your one-year anniversary at CII, mm -hmm. uh, that 2017 is also the, going to be the 15-year anniversary of the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Sarbanes-Oxley has been a success? Absolutely. Um, I think, um, I don't think there's any question if you look at what happened uh, with restatements um, over, over time, there, there was an increase as, as peop, uh, right after Sarbanes-Oxley passed, which was a sign, I think, that people were confronting issues that they hadn't really confronted before. Um, there were huge complaints, and I have to say, I, I, w I was at TIAA at the time that Sarbanes-Oxley was passed, and we were very, very supportive of it. Um, uh, there were a lot of doomsday scenarios about it at the time, and, and it, it actually has proven to be um, a, a very useful rule from, an, from the investor standpoint. Uh, d it did add some expense, there's no question about that. Um, but I don't think it's inordinate, and I think it has uh, substantially increased the reliability both, the, the, the confidence with which investors can rely on both financial statements and internal financial controls. So um, I think it's very successful. I also think that the PCOB is much stronger, much better than what preceded it. Um, now, there's another area in the accounting area that's there's somewhat limited visibility into it as compared to some other procedures, but it's been a much more robust process, clearly, and I, uh, I'm sure it's aggravating to the um, accounting firms uh, often, but I think it's a much better process. Um, my, my boss at TIAA had uh, been on the uh, predecessor to the PCOB and found it a very frustrating experience with um, not much accomplished, and uh, PCOB has been a good agency for investors. Well, we, the, the CAQ and the profession as a whole, see the value of having mm -hmm. a strong regulator, and so uh, we may have our differences of opinion from time to time, but I think like investors, I think auditors, public company auditors also think that having uh, not only the PCOB, but the other uh, mm -hmm. reforms that Sarbanes-Oxley brought in as being very helpful and mm -hmm. increasing audit quality, so I think it's a win-win for all of That's us. That's good. good. Well, Ken, this has been fascinating. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for joining us for this edition of Profession in Focus. Thank and I want to thank all of you for joining us as well. Mm -hmm.